uh, I will talk, basically I will talk about two questions. I hope I won't be too long. Uh, maybe the presentation of the, of the presentation itself wasn't that good in the media. I won't really talk much in general about cultural economics. I will focus on two specific questions. And basically, I will first, in the first part of the presentation, I will talk about the studies about economic effects of culture events, which is a very uh, hotly debated topic especially in past years when we all know that culture needs additional arguments to justify its uh, support, either its public support or its private support. I will present two main types of methods that are most commonly used in cultural economics to estimate it, and I will mostly point to the failures of both types of these methods, and I will point to the solution the solution that is basically applied, I think, one of the first times ever in the estimation of the economic effects of European capital of culture that was happening here in Maribor in 2012. And in the second part, I will try to be short, rather short on the second part, I will talk about the value of culture, mostly the non-use values, which are an important part, especially of the economic value of public goods, and I will present an economic model of non-use values. So these non-use values have been discussed a lot in environmental economics, Economics, also in culture economics, but so far they have been estimated in contingent valuation studies and almost no formal mathematical model was given. I will just shortly present the model that I made when I was studying in USA and show what are the consequences, what were the consequences when we analyzed the model. We managed to prove a lot of the evidence from contingent valuation studies and some additional, additional materials. So when we talk about the economic effects of culture events, Basically, uh, Bruce Allen Seaman, who is the most referenced author in this field, he was also here in Maribor in 2012 in September, uh, is talking about three, three parts of the economic impact of a culture event. So basically, firstly, you have the short-run spending impact. This is the most general thing that is estimated in the economic studies, the most known economic studies. So basically, how much does the spending how much new money is inserted with a culture event in the economy? How much does this help the economy on, in, on short term? These studies that evaluate this are called the economic impact studies, and they're the most renowned studies about the economic impacts of culture events. Second thing is the long run increases in productivity and economic development. I won't talk about this much. Too few studies are made according to this methodology, but we won't specifically address this problem, although it would be an interesting thing to see what would these studies, if they were to be made more often, tell us. The third part is the consumption impact. So basically, how much do the people value a culture event? What are the preferences? You ask the people how much would they be willing to pay or willing to accept for a certain public good for, uh, let's say, a culture event to happen. So there is, an, there is already at the start of a very big problem. Can these effects really just be added up? Are these effects different or, or I, I mean, can they really just be added or do they overlap to a certain extent? In what relationship are they? This is also another thing that is not very clear presently in cultural economics. So when we talk about the most common studies, the economic impact studies, Basically, when we talk about these studies or when we speak about Slovenia, it has to be mentioned that at present no such study has been made on a specific cultural event in Slovenia. So economic impact studies in Slovenia, three studies have been made, but only on a general national level. Such studies basically measure, let's say, how much does the GDP raise, how much new employment spaces are raised by a cultural event, how much new tax income is raised by a cultural event. The main method is, of course, the Keynesian multiplier. You all know now in the crisis, a lot of the people again speak about Keynesian multipliers. So basically, the Keynesian multipliers are useful because they value not just the direct effects, but also indirect and induced effects. So if you insert a money in the economy, this money circles further in the economy. So, uh, at least that's how the Keynesian theory goes. And at the end, you end up with a larger effect. So mostly the economists in economic impact studies take the general spending of a cultural event, let's say in Maribor, how much money was given, they use the multiplier, they multiply the spending with the multiplier, and they receive a sort of a number, and usually they just end with this number and say that this is how much the economic effect was. And another important thing is that such studies are done ex ante, before the event, 
Very few, almost none study has been done in cultural economics. What were the real effects of these events after the event has taken place? So there are, I won't go into deep history, uh, these studies gained influence in the 1970s. Of course, in the 1970s, the US was facing the stagflation, the deep, the deep recession, and of course, the public budget has shrinked, and people needed to justify the, public su the support of the public goods, and culture was among them. So the, the economic impact studies gained momentum. Some of the most influential studies date from that period. There is a whole tradition of these studies that are made even now, let's say, this arts and economic prosperity study, which is mentioned here at the uh, second LNA. Uh, it is made every three or four years, and the results are, of course, tremendous for culture. I mean, culture, they, they say that culture means real business, according to these studies. Each dollar is multiplied eight times, according to these studies. Of course, if you say that the return is eight in economics, this is sound for something to be, to be uh, careful about these studies. And uh, also, these such studies are made in Europe. A few of the studies are mentioned. And in Slovenia, three such studies have been made. One in the 2003 when Micho Mrkaic, the famous economist, criticized culture for not having public effects. And this study was made at that time by, by the Ministry of Culture. This study was made uh, by Slovenian Culture Association. I also participated in this study. And the third study was made in 2011 uh, according to the WIPO, to the methodology of intellectual property rights. The results are, to say, positive for culture. This second study actually uh, found out that the multiplier for culture is bigger than any other multiplier for public sectors. So it is more profitable, let's say, to invest, at least according to the multiplier theory, in culture than, let's say, in education, in healthcare, or in other public goods. The multipliers to the studies appear to be greater. Um, but, of course, such studies are subject to numerous critiques. I mean, uh, the critiques are mentioned here. I won't go into detail about every, every of this. It has become almost a sport or a hobby of cultural economists to criticize the economic impact studies. Such studies are very, for, very rarely made by cultural academics. They're mostly made by cultural organizations. They're criticized because they use multiplier, they, their, their use of multipliers is wrong. They attribute all the spending in the, in the city to, just to the culture event. They don't account because very often the crowding out effect happens. The, the visitors to cultural events sometimes crowd out visitors for other events. There is a big question, what is really, the, what is the new money in the economy and what is the money that would be there in any case? So, of course, you have to take care only, uh, take account only of the new money. There is also other things, not including the non-market benefits, other, uh, of course, exposed verification. Are they really the results after the event? You project the event ahead of the event, but are, they, are such events really there? As said by Bruce Allen Seaman, in sports economics, when the exposed studies are often made, such effects, let's say in case of Olympic Games, the predicted effects are almost never there. If you pr project that there will be 100,000 free em employment spaces, very often you come out that uh, the effect was, let's say, 20% or 10% of, of the predicted sum. So, uh, finally, what was, uh, what was the point of Professor Simon when he was in Maribor? He said that if the marginal value of such economic impact study was zero when I was writing my most influential article in 1987, imagine how negative is this number, the marginal value, the value of such additional study, right now when tons of additional studies are made according by, by very poor methodologies. So the answer that was provided so far was contingent valuation methodology. This contingent valuation is basically microeconomically oriented, uh, oriented study. Basically, to tell it very, in a very simple sense, you define a target population. Let's say in Maribor, you, you, you let's say define the Maribor population or the population of the six cities. And then you ask the residents, the inhabitants of the cities, how much would they be willing to pay to, let's say, the economic capital of culture take place in, a, 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 let's say, a re reduced forum, also in 2013 and 2014. So basically what you do, you construct a market that doesn't exist, 
let's say in environmental economics, you ask the people how much they value a clean air. Of course, clean air is not sold on the market. So you construct a hypothetical market, and then you judge the value of this event of, of, of a certain good according to the preferences, to the value expressed by the residents that you ask them this, this, these questions. This debate also raised a lot of a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, debate, a lot of attention, especially in the, at the end of the 1990s when there was an oil spit by the tanker Exxon Valdez and the uh, uh, American authorities wanted to know how much was the real damage of such, of such occurrence. They even formed this uh, national, uh, the, the so-called Blue Ribbon Panel chaired by two Nobel laureates, Ken Arrow and Bob Solow, and the judgment of this panel was positive. They said that contingent valuation is a good method and it is capable of valuing the passive use values, the non-use values. So basically the real value, not just for those who spilled the oil and for those who are near neighbors, but for the whole country, for all the people who will be affected by the spilled oil by some environmental damage. But unfortunately, of course, also these methods are, have very, very deep problems. And, um, Basically, some are here more technical ones. Of course, one would already notion the hypothetical bias. When you ask people how much they value something, you don't know whether they will answer sincerely. Of course, someone can answer in a strategic manner. Someone can just answer some sum just so he gets rid of the interviewer and, and he has peace. And also, numerous other biases have been pointed by researchers in, in uh, economics. What, is mo what mo was mo most interesting for me is, firstly, it is not really addressing the economic effects. It doesn't answer how much employment spaces. I mean, what is this more hard to say economic effect of a culture event? Does it bring new employment? Does it bring the GDP? These questions went unanswered. They are only answered by impact methodology, by multiplier methodology, but as we saw, it is answered in a wrong manner. The numbers are not correct. And secondly, these type of studies are extremely expensive and difficult to perform. They're, if you want to perform them really well, according to the NOAA panel, you have to follow very, very strict guidelines, very rigid methodological rules. So it is very often very difficult to perform them. And in practice, a cultural organization almost is, in, I mean, these studies are infeasible for cultural organizations. You simply are very hard to make such a studies. That's, that's why these studies are mostly made by academics who, who get paid by some public, public funds to perform such researches. So in general, the summation, the, the, the dilemma was here. Some of the authors, like Richard Epstein, who is a libertarian, and you know that the libertarians are very hard to call something a public good. Still, he says that if you want to value public goods, you have to use the contingent valuation. And on the other hand, this was one of the severe critiques to contingent valuation in the 1990s by the Nobel laureate Peter Diamond and Jerry Hausman. They said, OK, is some number, if we know that the number is very problematic, is this really better than no number? So you end up with this, with this dilemma. Either you, you rely on some number, either you say that no number is actually better faced with such difficulties. So basically, what we, what we present is a solution. I think that the solution is rather simple, but it hasn't been really so much, in, especially in cultural economics. Basically, what we, be, what we do, what we're doing, we're, we haven't finished the study yet, in the uh, study of economic capital of culture Maribor 2012, we basically take the statistical data, um, which are, of course, after the event. We know right now how much will, uh, will be the in, was the in, were the incomes of the companies, how much were new employment rates, how much were new tourists in the, in, the, in the area, in Maribor, in other cities. And on the basis of this, we separate. We, we take all municipalities in Slovenia, all the 200 and so on municipalities, and we um, take six municipalities of the partner cities as the ones that were given treatment, and the other, of course, were not given treatment, similar as in medicine. And then, I mean, the, econo the econometrics using panel data analysis, time series, and so on, is rather, is rather simple. So you, so you can estimate what was the effect of the treatment given to these six cities that were partner cities of the European Capital of Culture. There are a number of advantages of this method. Firstly, it is done ex post after the event, so you will really know what were the real effects statistically, 
statistically observed from the data. It uses methodology that suffers from no such additional economic problems as impact studies, the overblown results, the Keynesian multipliers, and you don't face the hypothetical bias, the microfocus of the contingent valuation. It uses data measured under common methodology. The results can therefore be compared, not just for Maribor, for Slovenia, but also across other cultural events. It is not really that much expensive. The methodology is similar as in most other economic econometric studies. It is not also methodologically over complex. And it is, what is also very important, it can be used to study really the characteristics, the characteristic of a cultural event that most influences the economic impact of a certain event. So it opens up a whole to my opinion, a whole really new area for cultural economics to finally face the real questions that were asked and that it basically didn't answer. Uh, well, actually, uh, I research, uh, I mean, this, the, such studies are done very commonly in sports economics. Um, well, uh, what was su suggested to me by Professor Seaman, he said that basically, uh, he said that it would be really useful to make such study in Maribor, and we are doing it, because he said that in sports economics, almost never, as said previously, you almost never find out such effects that you project with the multiplier analysis. This is a study that was done on Olympic Games in Los Angeles in Atlanta, and the findings were ahead of the event, some researchers projected 77,000 new jobs and 37,000 only in Atlanta. Real effect was something between... 3,000 and 21,000. So in general, we could say that it was less than half of the projected, for the projected event. So uh, basically, yeah, uh, the main methods to use, of course, are, are, the, are from econometrics. You, some of you know, perhaps panel data, GMM, time series, and so on. We used panel data and uh, some difference in difference approach also in the Maribor study. And just for an illustration, the study is not finished yet. Just for an illustration, I will present the data that we received in Maribor. So this is a sim an analysis that was given for all cities pooled, all six cities. We hadn't come to any significant effect judging tourism, tourism because they're very different tourism effects in different six cities. Maribors has significant rates, Slovenia, Gradec, and Vilenia also. Some, some others didn't have such effect. And in general, the effect is not negative, of course, but it is statistically insignificant. So you cannot claim that because of the European capital of culture, there was significant raise in tourism in all six cities. Although if you take Maribor, the event is strongly, uh, strongly significant and uh, and large in, in, in um, uh, attitude, in multitude. So basically, uh, tw about 28,000 new visitors came to Maribor just because of European capital of culture. This is, of course, the difference. You, could, you can, of course, take the statistical data and just um, say in 2011 there were so many tourists, in 2012 there were many, there were more. But this is the effect just because of European capital of culture. And uh, uh, approximately 58 thousand new uh, uh, overnights happened because of European capital of culture, but we're speaking only about Maribor. And uh, some first results, but really a strong warning. These are really very preliminary results. We had the presentation two weeks here in Maribor, and some of the journalists really took these numbers for granted. So I warn again, I use this only for illustration that you get an impression what this method, what results can this method bring. So there are positive effects on the visitors to cultural events, approximately 15,000 new visitors in each theater in the region. There are positive results for incomes of firms, and I have to say here that the results appear to be even stronger than the multiplier suggests. Of, of course, one could speculate that the incomes of, of the firms in the Maribor are not higher just because of the new money inserted, but there was also the, impre the raised image of the city, all of the promotion that was raised in other, in other states. So because of this, perhaps the companies get, got larger incomes. There were no effects on monthly wages in the city, neither negative, neither positive, and there were no effects on new employment. This was something that surprised me, or sometimes we get even, at least as the study stands now, negative effects on new employment. We still have to take account what this really means. Of course, this is a total contradiction to the multiplier, to the multiplier effects. So we 
uh, we, we know for sure from this study that the results are really different from the multiplier study, so it would be really interesting to research this, uh, not just Maribor event, but other events using this methodology to get some better impression about, about the economic effects of culture. And just uh, for, at the end, I probably don't have much time left, I will present a second, a second thing that I wanted to talk about. So basically, the values of culture. The values of culture can be very briefly classified into three types. First, you have the use value. The use value, this hard economic value, the market value, the price that you pay for, for entering the certain culture institution. The non-use values, these are the values somebody has even though he's not using the event. I was never in India, I never visited Taj Mahal. Still, if somebody would ask me how much would I pay to preserve Taj Mahal, I would probably give, let's say, five euros on one euro to preserve Taj Mahal. So this is my non-use value. I'm giving it even though I'm not directly using these goods. So these values are very important for public, for public goods. And then you have the values totally outside of any economic system, the cultural values, in either their co collective values, as named here, or the inherent values, but we will mostly speak about the economic values. The non-use values is what will interest us. Uh, so on, there are numerous arguments for public support to the arts. Uh, those who are more from the economy heard about them. Pu the, the public goods. M what is mostly interesting for us is the externalities argument. So basically. Uh, some of you remember Professor Micho Merkic at the beginning of 2000 asks an, asked an interesting question in the journal Finance. He said, if you cannot prove culture is, of course, is not a proper public good, it is not rival, it is not uh, excludable. But if, if you can prove the externalities of culture, you can prove that culture deserves the public support. The state should interfere because you have market failure. So what I do in, in, next, in next slides, I, I briefly show that culture really has externalities and how can you show that, that it has externalities and basically present a model of non-use values. Basically, as I said, contingent valuation talked a lot about non-use values, but there was no economic model present. The, the main model used in the field is the Samuelson's model, Samuelson, the Nobel laureate of the 1950s. Uh, he, uh, in his articles in the 1950s, presented the foundations of ec the economics of public goods, of public good economics, and he presented the main model that is still most, most commonly used in the field. Other people from the donation field show that there is some crowding out. The public funds crowd out the, the private investments. Uh, Andreoni mostly spoke about, has spoken about uh, explanations for donor motives, other explanations. So the donors are not only motivated by the level of public good that they receive, but they only gain some satisfaction because they, they have satisfaction with their own donation. If they give a lot, they're more satisfied with themselves. They have feeling of pride, some altruistic values. Are they only cause this the warm glow altruism? And Brooks find out that there can be even crowding in, that sometimes public and private funds move in the same direction. So basically what we do in mathematics, we take the Summerson model, which is, which is presented above. Summerson talks about only two dimensions of the utility function, said, um, uh, utility from consumption of private good X and consumption of public good G. We add the third component, so the public good in our model is represented in two types. Not just the consumption is important, but also satisfaction with public good is important. So even if you consume zero of the public good, you still have satisfaction with public good. And by this, you can simply insert the users have use values and non-use values, and the non-users, of course, have only non-use values, and you get a very different maximization problem which can, you can also add the altruism component, the fourth component, the satisfaction with own donations, the fourth component, the, the small g that is inserted in all of the functions. And finally, what, were, what are the results? I won't go into the mathematics. The results show that uh, uh, the results confirm what we expected before doing this. The non-use values move in two directions. Because of non-use values, you have externalities. So basically, you have less donations. The equilibrium is less efficient. Because of non-use values, the people tend to actually give less. And on the other hand, because the users are more altruistic, because they have higher values, they also tend to give more donations. You have this altruism effect on the other hand. So when we compare both effects, 
the inefficiency of the equilibrium and the more efficiency, the more donations in the equilibrium, we found out that in any case, you get the externality effect. The, no the non-use values always act as externalities, so this is the proof that basically they can be used as an argument for public support to the public goods. Also, we did some comparative statics, which shows the evidence from contingent valuation that the user's donations are uh, almost always higher than the non-user's donations, or contingent valuation studies show this. The crowding out effect is higher for the users. It is almost always present, and it is higher for the users than the non-users. It is possible that you have crowding in, in certain cases, which confirms this evidence by, uh, by Arthur Brooks. And uh, finally, the relationship, if you have to determine the non-use values, uh, uh, are the non-use values of the user or of the non-user higher? You, the result is perhaps not that significant. You cannot determine this simply from this model. You have to do contingent duration studies and the non-use values determined from the empirical results of the, con of the contingent studies. So uh, the econometric results that we made using some previous data sets from contingent duration studies showed and confirmed all of these consequences. So we really know, we now know from also from the economic models that non-use values act as externalities in the uh, economic models. So finally, what was basically presented? What was gained from this presentation? Firstly, we presented a new model, a new, uh, new method to estimate economic effects of cultural events. So uh, to my opinion, I'm very strongly convinced of this, that this is really a solution to decades of few time methodological discussions, which are still present in cultural economics. On the conferences, people very often debate on small methodological issues in contingent valuation especially, and they still don't answer the really the most important question, which are presented here. Do cultural events really have the proclaimed economic effects? How large are they and on what? characteristics they depend upon. I, we really hope, or I hope, that this method, if it will be more frequently used in future, will finally be able to answer for different cultural events, not just for Maribor, are these economic effects of cultural events really there, such as predicted by the multiplier studies. And finally, we presented one of the few, first sensible economic models of non-use values. Such models really don't exist. Uh, which is probably a step ahead in exploring this uh, uh, concept from uh, public economics, and also what, what is an externality of our presentation. We, get, we have a new argument for public support to cultural goods or to any public good called values argument. If you can prove the non-use non values through contingent valuation studies, this is the necessary reason that you need to consider public support to this public good that you determine the non-use values for. So this is another new argument that we can add to the other arguments we, uh, we had on the previous slide for public support to public goods, not just for culture, but for any public good that you consider. Thank you.